Hey online family, thank you for joining us today. My name's Mariah. My name's Dylan, and let me tell you what we have planned for you today. We're gonna have our worship team come up and lead us into God's presence today, and then we're gonna have Pastor come up and share a word. Thank you for joining us and welcome home.
Hey, what's up, Church Called Home family? It's a new year. Praise God, we made it through a challenging year, and we believe God has some incredible things in store for you individually and for us corporately in 2021. Each year, we begin the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. For three weeks, we will meet for prayer Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m. There is no better way to start off the year than by setting aside some time to seek God. When you win in prayer, you win everywhere. We will begin our 21 days on January 4th and end on Sunday, January 24th. Now, if you've never read Pastor Jason's book on gaining spiritual leverage, that would be an incredible read during those 21 days. We hope to see you all here for prayer Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m. Now, before we get into the message, we would like to say thank you for your generosity. Your giving has enabled us to serve families, offer hope, and revamp spaces all throughout our building. You can give using any of the ways listed on your screen. Real quick, can we give a big shout out to all the people watching on Facebook right now? Come on, give it up for them. And, and all, the people, all the people who are watching on our YouTube channel, come on, give it up for them. We appreciate you watching. My favorite place to watch online is our online platform. So for all of those watching on the ACCH.online platform, come on, give it up for them. And one more, one more. To all the people on our website watching right now, big old hand clap, cheer. Come on, let them know how much you appreciate them. Thank you for joining us. You're a part of our family. It is the first Sunday in January. And I know people are still, many people are still in quarantine because we had a huge outbreak in Tennessee and Knoxville. And I know many people are still fearful. And so if you're watching online, we love you. We're praying for you. If we can do anything for you, let us know. Today's an exciting day for me because today's the official release of my latest book, Making a New Start. And it's a book that I wrote for you. It's not a book that I, I've never written a book that I thought, I just want to write this book because I want to write it. I've always written, I feel compelled, I feel called to write. And everything I've written, I've written for you. I, I, I write as Paul would write to the churches that he planted and he pastored and he labored for and prayed for. And so I believe this is going to be an encouraging book, an instructive book for you this year. And I've been doing, for the last few years, doing a book every year. And I thought, since I'm giving this book to everybody who is here in person today, and for months now, every person who's given their heart to Christ online, we've been sending digital copies of this book to them. We've been doing that for quite some time now. But uh, since I'm giving you a copy who are here in person... I thought it's only, it's only right that I do a message out of this book. And so today I want to share a message with you that I'm going to title, Making a New Start. How many of you are grateful for a new start, 2021? Amen. One of the reasons why I love a new year is because you get to make a new start. You get to start all over. One of the reasons why we love Friday is because we know we're ending a weekend and we're celebrating that it's just passed and we're getting ready to start, what, all over. When we start a new year, we say goodbye to the year that just passed. Thank God that 2020 is over and we get to embrace everything God has for us in that upcoming year. Now, I don't know about you, but for me growing up, I, I never had a starting problem. I love to start new things. When I was a little kid, I started peewee football. And my career in motocross started when at the age of five, my dad right there bought me my first motorcycle. Crazy, right? <laughs> if I bought Tori or Chaz a motorcycle at five, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I'd have been killed. I started Boy Scouts when I was a little kid. After I watched Karate Kid, I started karate lessons. Come on, any other, body, any, any other men in the house, you started karate lessons after Karate Kid. After I saw the first Rocky movie, I took up boxing. In elementary school, I started playing baseball. In high school, I started playing basketball and tennis. I never had a starting problem. I did, however, have a quitting problem. And I'm convinced that most people, they don't have a starting problem. I'm convinced that most people have a finishing problem. 
Now, now let me prove this to you. How many of you, you have a home improvement project? That you started months ago, maybe even years ago, and it's still not finished. Come on, raise your hand. Remember, you lie, you fry. (laughs) All right, let me get real with you. How many of you men, I'm not going to say his initials, but his name is Shirefi. (laughs) How many of you men, you have an automobile on your property? Y'all know where I'm going. And you've been saying for a long time you're going to restore that bad boy. But it has sat in the same place in the garage. Come on, Jason White. Come on, Bill Riffey. Come on, I know some of you guys. Come on, let's be honest. We have a finishing problem. Last weekend, as we closed 2020, I told you that in the year 2020, 69 people gave their heart to Christ in one of our services. But that that honestly is a fraction of... What normally happens. Do you know that in the last two years. In 2019 and in 2020. 313 people that we know of. Not including online. But in person. 313 people. Gave their heart to Christ. At the conclusion of one of our services. That's unbelievable. Come on. Thank God for that. Amen. But there is a pattern. And I want you to lean into what I'm saying today. There is a pattern. And I've watched this happen over and over and over again. Someone will come. And someone will hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And they'll hear me say something like, God's not mad at you. He's mad what? About you. And they'll hear the gospel maybe in a way they've never heard it before. And they'll raise their hand to say, I I want to receive Christ into my life. I I want to make heaven my home. And then they'll be on cloud nine for a while. It's usually a short period of time. And then they'll disappear. Now here's what I know. I know exactly what happened. And those of you who've been walking with Jesus for a while, you know what happened. In the heat of the moment, their temper got the best of them. And they said something they shouldn't say to their wife or Wife to her husband. They got in a moment of road rage on I-40 or on Tazewell Pike or on Chapman Highway or on Cedar Bluff. Oh, my Lord Jesus. You want to know where the devil is? Go on any of those places at rush hour. And why do they call it rush hour? Nobody's getting anywhere in a hurry. It should be slow hour, right? And they've said something they shouldn't have said. Or maybe they looked at something they shouldn't have looked at. And now they feel guilty, and so what happens is they disappear. I want you to know today that I have a goal in mind. And my goal is at the end of our time today, and at the end of your time reading that book that we're giving you today, that you never, ever, ever, ever again, ever give up. That you never clock out, that you never check out of the faith, but that you constantly run to Jesus. See, because I'm convinced of this, and if you're a note taker, I'd write it down. And if you're not a note taker, take that card Abby talked about out of your seat back, that black card, and write this down. I'm convinced of this. In eight years of pastoring and 20 some years of being involved in the local church, here's what I'm convinced of nobody gives up on Jesus. Nobody ever gives up on God. Not in the scripture and not in our world today. But every one of us, at some point, we will give up on ourselves. But nobody ever gives up on God. My goal today is at the end of our time today, you will never again give up on God and you'll never again give up on yourself. Look at what the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said, you will know the truth. Everybody say no. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I want you to notice something. Jesus did not say the truth alone will set you free. Jesus said you will know the truth. And when you come to the knowledge of the truth, when you understand the gospel, you'll be set free. The Bible says, God speaking, my people are destroyed for a lack of what? Knowledge. 
They don't know the truth. When Jesus talked about the sower that went forth and sowed seed in the ground, he said the seed was the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He said the seed fell on four different types of soil. There was only one type of soil that received the good news of Jesus and it bore fruit long term. And, and if you read the Bible, the Bible says, Jesus talking, he said, the, the, the soil, and the soil was the heart of the person. He said, the only person who received the seed and produced long-term fruit was the one who heard the gospel and understood it. So today, I want to talk about the truth as it pertains to us and God. I'm going to give you 10 things the Bible says about you and about your Savior, Jesus Christ, and His grace. And thank God for that second song we sang today, talking about the grace of God. I mean, we didn't orchestrate that, but what a perfect song. 10 truths that we know about from God's Word pertaining to you and pertaining to the grace of God. Here's the first one. We've all sinned. That's why Jesus came and He preached repent. The word repent means change your mind. Change your mind about the direction you're going. Change your, mind, change your mind about the things you're pursuing. Change your mind about how you think about God. Change your mind about the way God thinks about you. God's not mad at you. God's what? Mad about you. And the Bible says we've all sinned. How many of you have sinned? Raise your hand. Oh, man, come on. Everybody's hand, foot, both ears ought to be perked up. We've all sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the second thing we know. Sin incurs a debt. We're going to talk more about that in just a second. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And in Colossians 2, the Bible refers to how your sin and my sin created a debt between us and God. Here's the third thing we know. Remember, Jesus said you're going to know the truth and the truth will set you free. Does the truth alone set you free? No. It's your knowledge of the truth. That will make you free. So what's the truth? We've all sinned. We've all had sin that has incurred a debt between us and God. Here's the third thing we know. Christ took our sin upon Himself and He satisfied the debt once and for all. Man, thank God for Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. That's Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. I'm going to read to you. I'm going to read to you a bunch of scripture today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18, this is the Amplified. God through Jesus Christ reconciled us to Himself, bringing us into a place of favor and harmony with Him. When you receive Christ, Christ has reconciled us to God. What's the word reconciled mean? It means to bring into harmony. It means to make one account agreeable with the other account. Let me explain it to you like this. At the end of the month, you get a bank statement from your bank. Now, if at the end of your month, you open up your checkbook and you walk through your checkbook and your balance says at the end of this month, you have $1,000 in your checking account. Praise God. A stimulus check made it. But then if you get your bank statement and your bank statement says at the end of the month, you're $500 in the red. That means you have to take your checkbook to the bank and you have to reconcile your account with the bank's account. You have to go make things right with the bank. Now, I want to get on something here. If you have grown up around a legalistic church... If you have attended a legalistic church, you may have heard a preacher say something like this. You need to make things right with God. Well, I'm going to share some good news with you. It's already been done. Jesus, in Colossians chapter 2, Jesus canceled our debt, having nailed it to the cross. And according to 2 Corinthians 5.18, He reconciled us already to God. Oh, thank God for it. You ought to stand on your feet. You ought to thank God. I don't have to make things right with God. Jesus already made it right with God in me. 
And now He's called us to the ministry of reconciliation. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. I'm going to mess with some of our religious mindset today. In the NLT, the Bible says it this way. He canceled. Everybody say canceled. He canceled the record of charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. When Jesus died on the cross, what sin did he die for? Now let me, let, me, let me ask it like this. I heard somebody just said it. Was Jesus, when he was on the cross, was he dying for all the past sin? Was he dying for the past sin and the present sin? Was he dying for the past sin, present sin, and future sin? Or was he dying for all sin? All sin. So think about this. When Jesus died, you had not even been born yet. If you hadn't been born yet, you hadn't lived yet to sin yet. Yet Jesus was dying for your sin before you ever sinned. See, this is why John says in 1 John Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I'm writing you these things because I don't want you to sin. But if someone stumbles, if someone messes up, if someone gets caught in the heat of the moment, if someone does something they know they shouldn't do and they sin, he said, we have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus Christ the righteous. And Jesus becomes our covering when we fail. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming. And think about what John the Baptist said. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Several years ago, I I read a book by Andy Stanley. And the book was titled Enemies of the Heart. And one chapter of that book was devoted to how we process guilt. And I want to read to you something that Andy Stanley says in this book. He says, guilt, guilt creates a debt. Sin creates a debt. Guilt says, I owe you. For example, consider a man who runs off with another woman and abandons his family. Without realizing it at the time, he has stolen something from every member of his family. Now in the moment he doesn't think of it in terms like that. Uh, Initially he's only thinking about what he has gained. But the first time he's with his little girl and his little girl looks at him with her sweet little eyes and she says, Daddy, why don't you love my mommy anymore? At that moment his heart is stirred and he feels the weight of his sin and his guilt. And all of a sudden dad is in debt to every person in that family. Now a debt-to-debtor relationship has been established. Have you ever noticed you never see the person who owes you money? Let let me get right down in our world. If somebody owes you $100, you never see them. They never call you. They don't text you. They don't come by to say hello and check on the family, see how you're doing. If somebody owes you $100, you don't see them. The reason you don't see them is because they don't have it to pay. If you want to find them, you have to go find them. People who owe you money don't come around. Can I tell you that's why people come, receive Christ, and disappear? It's because they've done something they feel guilty for, and now they feel as though I've got another debt that I can't pay. I'll never be able to get it all right. I'll never be able to... Find my perfection. I just don't have the willpower. Let me tell you something. When you understand the gospel, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Because you realize that Christianity is not about what you've done. Christianity is about what Jesus did. It's not about you making promises to God. It's about you clinging to the promises God made to you. Oh, come on, somebody shout amen. See, guilt will tell you to do one of two things. Man, I want to help you today. Guilt's going to tell you to do one of two things. Guilt's going to tell you, number one, you need to run. Because you're guilty. You've sinned. 
First time I ever prayed and I asked Jesus to come into my life, I was 17. I'm going to tell you exactly how it happened. I went to a holiness Pentecostal church across the railroad tracks from our house in Hiram. I got on my Sunday best on a Wednesday night. Because you know you got to get on your Sunday best. You're going to get saved. God only hears you if you're wearing a tie. Amen. <laughs> got on my penny loafers. Come on. You know you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost if you wear penny loafers. Amen. Got on my penny loafer. went to that church. I knelt at an altar. And here's what I said. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I said, God, I promise. Forgive me for all my sin. I promise I'll never do it again. If your prayer of salvation contains the words, I promise I will never again, you will end up coming right back to that place and praying again until you get it right. So what happened is within 24 hours, I was right back into sin. I had some serious addictions. So what happened is for two years, I ran from God. My guilt told me to run. I remember one time I had a friend who lived, I probably told you this story a million times, I had a friend who lived... Uh, on, on a little road that when I went to his house, I had to pass by this little white Baptist church. And every time I would get in eye shot of that church, I would look away. I'd act like I was looking for my, my favorite Bobby Brown cassette. Or, you know, where, where's that Two Live Crew CD? Come on. Where, where, where's that winger? Well, I know I got that winger cassette in here somewhere. Come on, y'all don't act like y'all didn't listen to some of them groups now. Like God didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't even look at it. My guilt told me, you got to run. And if your guilt doesn't tell you to run, your guilt will tell you, you need to try harder. But I want to set you free today. Salvation is not about you trying harder. Salvation is about you receiving everything Jesus did for you on the cross. He canceled your sin debt. He reconciled us to God. He took away the sin of the world. And now we have a choice. We can receive His righteousness, His gift of grace, or we can say, I'm going to pay for my sin myself. And there is a place we can do that. It's called hell, and it takes forever to pay that debt off. Trying to earn God's favor is called legalism. And legalism kills people more than sin does. Let me tell you why. Because legalism says, I'm not putting my faith in Christ. I'm putting my faith in myself. What I can do. What I can withstand. What I can say no to. When you have a legalistic mindset, when you don't do good enough, you condemn yourself. When you do enough in your own eyes, you start condemning everybody else. You been there? You lie? What? Come on, you lie? You fry. Here's what I'm trying to say. When you realize what Christ has done for you, I believe you'll never again give up. That's what Paul was trying to communicate to the Corinthian church. Look at 1 Corinthians 4.1. He says, therefore, remember, every time you see the word therefore in the Bible, you have to stop and ask, why is this what? Therefore. He says, therefore, since God in His mercy has given us this new way. What's the new way? It's Jesus. It's what I'm talking about right now. It's about you not trying to live up to the standard, but you grabbing Christ, who is our standard, and saying, thank you for setting me free. He said, therefore... Since God in His mercy has given us a new way, we should never, what? Give up. Because when you understand the truth, you understand you don't have to give up. Two weeks after I gave my heart to Jesus, I was 19. I came back. I ran for two years. My mom invited me to come to church with her. I, I watched people during worship. I saw the peace of God on their face. I saw the joy of the Lord on their face during worship. And I did not have what they had. I went back to that altar and I didn't say, God, forgive me, I promise. I said, God, forgive me, I need you so bad. I cannot do this without you. And Jesus set me free. Set me free. Then here's the thing. Two weeks later, I got with some friends and I messed up bad. For the first time in my life, I didn't give up. 
I, I, listen, I played baseball, I quit baseball. I started Boy Scouts, I quit Boy Scouts. I started tennis, I quit tennis. I went to basketball tryouts when, when I was in high school. And, and, and they were running a drill at tryouts where you go under the, the, the goal and you, you grab uh, the, the ball as it went through the basket. And then you, you I don't, I, you can tell I'm not a basketball player. <laughs> you did a layup. I, I did 32 layups, I think it was. You know how many times I made it? Zero. I hit, the, I, I hit the goal one time. After that drill, I just walked out of the gym and I got in my car and went home. Everything until that point, I tried, I quit. But that day, I thought, I'm not going to give up on my faith. Will you give me another minute? I'm going to take it. I'm, give me another minute. How many give me another minute? Raise your hand. I got one minute, two minutes, three minutes. I got 50 more minutes right here. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament. This story will help you if you get a hold of this story. My favorite story in the New Testament is when Peter met Jesus on the Sea of Galilee after he denied Jesus and Jesus was resurrected. See, when, when Peter met Jesus, Peter was fishing. He had fished all night long. He hadn't caught anything. So Jesus wanted to call Peter away from that business and he wanted to make Peter a disciple. So he, so he came up to Peter. He was on the seashore as Peter was coming in from a night and he hadn't caught anything. And he told him, push out in the deep, drop your nets off. And he caught a boat sinking catch. And then when he got to the, shore, to the shore, Jesus looked at him and he said, I want you to leave this business, leave this life, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisherman. I'm going to make you an evangelist. And so he did. He left that old life and he followed Jesus. But then when Jesus needed him the most at his trial, Peter denied him three times. It was the darkest hour in Peter's life. Peter was a preacher. Peter was a faith healer, if you will. Peter had cast demons out of people. Peter had, had walked on water with Jesus. And now Peter has sinned three times. Made a conscious decision to sin. Sin's not a mistake. You, you know, we all say things like, Well, you know, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. A mistake is when you bump into somebody at Walmart with your shopping cart. Sin is not a mistake. It's intentional. I know at my 10-year class reunion, I met a guy named Eric that I used to run around with. And so we hadn't seen each other in 10 years. And I was like, hey, man, you have kids. We were asking the same questions. You know, you always ask. So you have kids. He said, yeah, I got three. I said, man, your wife knew you. Man, you guys must be happy. He said, oh, no, he said, I'm not married. He said, I have three children by three different women. I said, come on now. All right. He said, oh, we all make mistakes. I was like, bro, come on. You didn't accidentally get three different ones. Come on now. You may not have been intending to, but you did intend to. Just being real. Can we be real at church? Can we talk about real life at church? So Peter made a decision to deny the Lord. And then the resurrection happened. So what happened is, when the resurrection happened, Peter felt guilty and Peter went back to his old way of life. We would say Peter backslid. He went back to his old life. He, for, he, he forsook the call of God on his life. He turned his back on the things of God. And he went back to his old way of life. And so Peter's fishing all night. It's the second time in, that we know of in Peter's life he does this. Fished all night long, didn't catch anything. He's coming in. The sun's coming up. He's exhausted. And somebody's already frying some fish on the, on the beach. And they, they scream out. Peter doesn't recognize him because the sun's coming up. He's a far distance off in the... Water and, and, and there's a voice that says, hey, cast your nets off to the side. When he does, he catches another supernatural catch and he knows this is Jesus. And he jumps in the water and he swims to Jesus. Now get this, this is such a beautiful story. When they meet face to face, Jesus did not say, why did you do that? I needed you. You were my man. I mean, we did all this stuff together, and you turned your back on me? He didn't say that. He, he, didn't, he didn't say, well, you promise me you'll never do this again. He didn't say that. He said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I do. He said, then go feed my sheep. You know what he was saying? He was saying, Peter, you weren't born for this lifestyle. You were born for this. Leave this and go be who I called you to be. Get this. Let me give you another one. Are you still with me today? 
Oh, I could talk about this forever. Don't worry, I'm not. I can, I can, I can smell the roast beef <laughs> right now. Oh, man, thank God for lunch. You're, you're about to get there, okay? <laughs> Think about this. Before Peter denied the Lord, Jesus said this. He said, Peter, Satan's desire to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Now think about how he said he prayed. He didn't say, I prayed that you wouldn't fail. I prayed that you wouldn't sin. I pray that you won't turn your back on me. I pray that you won't deny me. He said, I pray that your faith won't fail. He knew Peter was going to mess up, but what he was saying is, I pray you don't give up. I pray you keep staying in the fight. I pray you get back on track. I pray you cry out to me again. I pray that you get up. When you understand the truth, the truth will set you free. So real quick, what is the truth? We've all sinned. Our sin incurs a debt. Christ came to satisfy that debt. And when you receive Jesus Christ, that point, everything changes. Because when you receive Christ, you become a child of God. Now before that, you're a child of wrath. You're a son and daughter of disobedience. You're at enmity with God. But the moment you receive Christ, you become a child of God. That's John chapter 1. You are gifted His righteousness. That's Romans chapter 5. The word righteousness means to be right with God. So you're right with God not because of what you've done You're right with God because you've received Christ and it's what He's done that makes you right with God. Man, if you can't can't hear that and not wiggle, come on, Jesus. You are gifted His righteousness. You know why I'm right with God? Because of Christ. And then get this, you stand blameless before Him in love. That's Jude 1.24. And God's favor rests on your life. That's Psalm 5.12. The Holy Spirit comes alive inside of you. That's Romans chapter 8. And the angels of the Lord encamp around you. That is Psalm chapter 34. And you are kept by the power of God for salvation. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. When I came to Jesus, my question was not how do I get saved. My question was how do I stay saved. Seriously, that's what I wondered. It wasn't, how do I get saved? I knew that. Jesus died for my sin. I cry out to Jesus. My question was, how do I stay saved? We look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Am I helping anybody but myself? The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Thank God for hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. This is the verse right here. Look at this. It's reserved in heaven for you, those of you who are being kept by the power of God through faith for what? Salvation. The way you get saved is faith in Jesus. The way you stay saved is faith in Jesus. The word kept, everybody say kept. The original Greek word used right there means to have a military defense around you. Now when I read that, I thought about a story I read not long ago. And I want to read it to you and then I'm going to pray. We're going to close. In the 1940s, Boeing went into a contract agreement with the U.S. military. They were to develop what we now know as the B-52 Intercontinental High Altitude Nuclear Bomber. In total, there were 744 B-52s produced between 1952 and 1962. A B-52 can fly at an altitude of over 55,000 feet. That's 17,000 feet higher than a passenger plane. A B-52 will fly at a speed of 650 miles per hour, just short of breaking the sound barrier. They can launch a cruise missile from hundreds of miles away from their intended target, and they can penetrate those targets with extreme accuracy. Now here's what blows my mind. Each B-52 bomber, remember there were 744 of them produced, Each one of them has a payload, a nuclear payload, seven times as lethal as the bombs we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Seven times as lethal, and there's 700 
and 44 of them. But this is what blew me away. And it made me proud to be an American. During the Cold War, you may not realize this, I didn't know it, maybe you do. During the Cold War, our military kept a fleet, not one, but a fleet, of B-52 bombers in the sky seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for eight years. For eight years during the Cold War, our military kept a fleet of those bombers, each bomber having a, a payload seven times as lethal as what was dropped on Japan in World War II. For eight years, and all our country was doing was watching for us, keeping us safe, keeping us from harm. And if anyone tried to launch a nuclear attack on our country, that fleet of B-52s was ready to come to our aid. Our country was keeping us. When I read that, I thought, my God, it makes me proud to be an American. Thank God for a country that is fighting for us, keeping us. But can you imagine if our country did that to keep us safe? Can you imagine the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 5, you are kept by the power of God for salvation. You're going to get to heaven one day and look back and you're going to say, my God, what you did to keep me in the faith. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message today. I want to do three things real quick. First of all, I want to talk to those of you who you're away from God. You don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Right where you are, I want to encourage you to open your heart up and receive Christ into your life. One of the things we say at a church called home all the time is that God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. So right where you are, come on, pray with me. Now, if you're driving down the road listening, you might want to pull off the road before you go closing your eyes and driving. But right where you are, come on, let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus. That's right. Come on, Lord Jesus. I, I need you in my life. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I give you my heart today. In Jesus' name. Come on, say it with me. Amen. Hey, listen, I want to encourage you. If you prayed that prayer with me, let us know. We want to celebrate. I've got a new book called Making a New Start. That's what you've done today. And I want to send you a copy of that. So if you're watching from our online platform, there's a place on that platform where you can connect with us. If you're watching on social media, you can text the words Welcome Home to the number 94000. We'll send you a link where you can fill out a digital copy of our connection card. Hey, also, if you are a part of our church family and you want to give, we appreciate your giving during this time. There's a place on our platform where you can do that. There's a variety of other ways you can do it, and that's going to be on your screen. Last but not least, we love you. We appreciate you. We're praying for you. Thank you for staying engaged with us. God bless.